Here at The Murder Sheet, we work hard to bring you newsworthy reports and interesting interviews. Sometimes we get into the habit of working so hard that we start dealing with burnout. We push off fun activities while focusing exclusively on work. Nowadays, when we find ourselves dealing with that pressure, we try to remind ourselves that we've earned some fun. Then we pull out our phones to play Best Fiends, the fiendishly delightful mobile puzzle game that we are both obsessed with. The free-to-download game sees a fellowship of brave bugs battling it out with invading slugs. It's a puzzle game. It's fun to make matches that set off rockets and other pyrotechnics, racking up bigger and bigger moves until you defeat a level for good. It's a fully customizable game, allowing you to pick your own favorite fiends to take on the slugs. Plus, you get to explore new levels, new challenges, and new worlds all the time. So you're always encountering something fun and novel as you play. I'm on level 262. I'm crushing Kevin as usual. I'm on level 995. So that's what you were doing while I was editing the show. You've earned your fun time. Go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Content warning. This episode contains profanity, racism, violence, and murder. It was a little after 6 a.m. on June 6, 2013, in Sacramento, California. Toussaint Harrison and Justin Oliphant, two young African-American men, started their day by ducking into a quality inn and snagging some of the free food the hotel provided their guests for breakfast. Their next stop was the parking lot of a nearby McDonald's, where they hoped they could use the food to barter with the eatery's customers. Somewhere along the line, Harrison at least smoked some methamphetamine. He carried the glass pipe he used in his backpack. Joseph Paul Leonard, a white man, and his friend Samantha Silva headed for the McDonald's as well, arriving there in Leonard's truck. Leonard was a mechanic who'd faced criminal charges in the past for some violent outbursts. His friend Samantha had a mental disability. It's not clear what race she was. They stopped at the restaurant to grab some coffee. It was a beautiful morning, bright and sunny. Before lunch, one of the four would be gravely, fatally injured, and another one would be sitting in the back of a cop car, facing the prospect of never again spending a moment of life outside of police custody. Their ultimate fate, depending not so much on what happened, but rather on why it happened. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders, a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, the murder sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout season one to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We don't just rely on skimming the headlines. We dive into these cases to bring you in-depth coverage. We're The Murder Sheet, and this is The Lot. Much of what happened in the parking lot that day was captured on video footage or witnessed by reliable, independent witnesses. 
There is not, then, much dispute about the broad details of what occurred. Harrison and Oliphant decided to use the food they'd grabbed from the hotel as a business opportunity. They would approach people walking in or out of the restaurant, ask them if they were hungry, mention the breakfast items they'd snatched, and then ask for cigarettes or something in return. It's difficult to imagine that their efforts were terribly successful. How many people planning for an Egg McMuffin would instead jump at the chance to get food with an uncertain provenance from a drug user who randomly approaches them in the parking lot? Samantha Silva certainly didn't find their attention to be welcome. She walked out of the restaurant a minute or two ahead of her friend, Joseph Paul Leonard. We're not sure why. Perhaps he'd stop by the bathroom. As soon as she got into the lot, she noticed Harrison and Oliphant. Harrison was on a bike. The men went into their spiel. They asked her if she was hungry, offered her some of the food, and then asked her for some cigarettes or money. She let them know she wasn't interested and went past them to Leonard's truck. When Leonard joined her there a moment later, she let him know that the men had been annoying her. A furious Leonard confronted the two men, demanding that they leave Silva alone. Things got out of control quickly. Soon, Leonard began hurling racial slurs at the men, including the N-word. And then things got even worse. Leonard grabbed a long chain from the back of his truck and swung it wildly at the young men. They fought back. One of them managed to land a punch on Leonard. Oliphant took out a knife, but threw it wildly at Leonard. It struck him on the side, hard enough to leave a bruise. Harrison grabbed a bit of broken glass from the ground, and he tossed it at Leonard as well. It hit his cheek, leaving a bloody wound. All the while, Leonard was screaming at the men, using racial slurs. The fight was quick. It only lasted about a minute. Leonard retreated returning to the safety of his truck. Meanwhile, Oliphant and Harrison headed towards the front door of the McDonald's. But things were not over yet. Leonard put his truck into reverse, backing it up to where the two black men stood by the McDonald's entrance. He leapt out of his vehicle and, while twirling the chain over his head like a cowboy, started pursuing the men around the parking lot. This chase was brief, again lasting no more than a minute or two. At that point, Leonard apparently decided that if he could not harm Harrison, he could at least harm the man's bicycle. He went back to where Harrison had left the bike and stomped on it furiously. He even picked it up, as if to throw it. But by that time, Oliphant had rushed to Leonard's truck and warned that he would shatter the vehicle's windows. Leonard dropped the bike. Harrison quickly grabbed it, and then he and Oliphant left the parking lot. Leonard, meanwhile, went inside the restaurant for a moment, ostensibly to, quote-unquote, report what had just happened. And then he returned to his vehicle and drove out of the lot. But, incredibly, things were still not over yet. After leaving McDonald's, Harrison and Oliphant went to another parking lot one that led to an international house of pancakes. Oliphant was walking, and Harrison was riding his bike. They were probably hoping to try to repeat their food barter scheme in front of the other restaurant. But they never got the chance. As they walked through the lot, Oliphant heard a loud revving of an engine from behind him. He turned and spotted Leonard's truck, coming towards him at full speed. Instinctively, he dove out of the way, landing hard on the concrete. Leonard wasn't quick enough to hit him. Instead, his truck ran into a sign for a car wash. Furious, Leonard threw his vehicle into reverse and turned his attention to Harrison, who was still on his bike. He headed straight for the bicyclist. Oliphant frantically yelled for his friend to get out of the way, but it was too late. Leonard struck Harrison. The cyclist flew up into the air, hitting Leonard's windshield. Then he hit the ground, where he lay motionless and bleeding. Leonard reversed his truck and made another couple of tries to hit Oliphant. 
but the young man was able to jump and run and maneuver his way to safety, eventually escaping the area altogether. Meanwhile, Dan Gandy, who worked at a nearby business called Clutch Mart, heard all of this commotion and took a glance outside. What he saw horrified him. Harrison lay on the ground, bloody and in obvious need of help. Gandy yelled for an associate to call 911 and then rushed out to see what he could do. When he got outside, he saw Leonard, apparently frustrated that Oliphant had gotten away, return his attention to Harrison. Leonard aimed his truck at the motionless man and gunned it, heading straight for Harrison. Gandy responded to this in a split second by doing something quite heroic. He ran in front of Harrison, putting himself squarely between the fallen man and the oncoming truck. Leonard didn't stop or even slow down. He just continued towards Gandy. It wasn't until he was within 10 feet of Gandy that he finally turned his truck away and slowed to a stop. Leonard got out of the truck and walked to Harrison, who lay unconscious on the ground. He began yelling racial slurs and insults at the wounded man, and then started kicking him violently in the head, over and over again. Dan Gandy's heroics weren't done yet. He dashed into the store, retrieved a large pry bar. Brandishing it, he ordered Leonard to get away from Harrison. There was nothing like listening to a true crime podcast late at night and then rushing to make sure all your doors and windows are locked. We've definitely been there. But these days, we feel much less worried about our safety thanks to our Simply Safe home security system. And the nice thing about Simply Safe is that they're flexible and affordable without compromising their service. It's Simply Safe, your safety is the number one concern. But they're offering top-notch services for an affordable price. And our listeners will get a special deal on 40% off their advanced security system. Back when we lived in a tiny apartment in Brooklyn, we could have really used this Simply Safe system. It doesn't require any drilling, so it's perfect for renters. Today, we love being able to check into our system via an app on our phones. It's great to be able to monitor our crystal clear HD live streams of our security cameras. It makes us feel like we're taking charge of our own safety. Don't miss this chance to save big when you protect your home with the best. Get 40% off your order when you visit simplysafe.com slash msheet today. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes. That's simplysafe.com dot com slash m sheet. There's no safe like simply safe. We strive to inform the public with our reporting, but running a podcast can be a stressful enterprise. There's lots of sitting hunched over a computer, getting frustrated over uncooperative editing software. So that's why we are thrilled with our sponsor Tenasi, a company that makes a range of products from a special and potent CBD plus CBDA formula. Kevin and I have made their lotions, salves, and tinctures a key part of our daily rituals. We feel they keep us calm and reduce our aches and pains. We hadn't tried out many CBD products in the past, but we found that Tenasi's pure and potent formulas really work for us. The most popular Tenasi products are the soft gels. Customers often take these right before bedtime to allow for better sleep and recovery. You can read feedback from other customers on Tenasi's website, talking about how these products have changed their lives. We also love that Tenasi is supportive of scientific progress. A total of 5% of all its revenue goes back to university researchers so they can keep looking into the CBD plus CBDI formula. Go to Tenasi.com and use code MSHEET to get 50% off at checkout. That's T-A-N-A-S-I dot com to get 50% off for your first order with promo code MSHEET. Statements regarding efficacy and safety have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. These products are not intended to diagnose, prevent, treat, or cure any disease. As a cowed Leonard moved back, Gandy quickly reached into the man's truck and retrieved the vehicle's keys from the ignition. At that point, 
he ordered Leonard to sit on the tailgate and wait for law enforcement to get there. Leonard obeyed the order, glowering at Gandhi. Leonard let him know that when this was all over, he would come back for Gandhi, and the two of them would settle it. When police arrived, they tossed Leonard in the back of a camera-equipped patrol car and started recording. And he started talking. It turned out he had quite a lot to say. Here are some excerpts. That fucker dies. Oh, well, he tried to kill me. I was fearing for my life. You see what they did to me, man. They chased me. Then I beat him off me. And the next thing I know, you know, I'm over here. We're over here. I don't know. It just happened so fast. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm, I'm wrong for you. You know my actions. I doubt if I'm going to squeak out of this very easily, sir. I mean, it was pretty bad. If those punks wanted bad, they got bad. I became the aggressor. I realize this, you know. But they were aggressive. But then they started running because I started getting crazy. Just because we got Obama for a president, these people think they're real special. And I'm not prejudiced. I don't think I'm going to walk on this one. Honestly. You and I both know they did that to you. You have all the right to do whatever you want to do. That don't make me an exception. I realize this. But I'm not going to take it from these people or anybody. You know, I'm a law-abiding citizen turning over a new leaf, and look what happens. I really feel bad about that. I really do. I don't think none of it was right. You know, I think people are getting tired of being abused by the situation, the way people are being. I myself am tired of it. I am victimized every time I turn around. This could have happened to your son if you had one out there. This got too out of hand for me, man. A couple of days later, Harrison died from his injuries. According to court documents, his death was due to blunt force injuries to the head. He also suffered blunt force injuries to his torso, a dislocated and fractured right clavicle, five broken lumbar vertebrae, and blunt force injuries to his arms and legs. His injuries were consistent with being struck by a motor vehicle. The pathologist believed more of Harrison's injuries were caused by being hit by the truck than by being kicked or stomped. But that distinction was largely academic since, of course, the same person was responsible for kicking him and also striking him with the vehicle. Leonard, then, was charged with first-degree murder in the death of Harrison and attempted premeditated murder regarding Oliphant. The government also asked for Leonard's sentences to be enhanced because prosecutors classified them as hate crimes. In other words, they argued that at least part of the reason why Leonard went on his rampage was because both Harrison and Oliphant were black. Some people criticize hate crime laws. They argue that such legislation basically punishes people for what they are thinking. But of course, how we evaluate a great many crimes depends on what the perp was thinking. Did he believe he was acting in self-defense? Did he plan it out in advance, or was it something that happened in the heat of the moment? The answers to questions like that make a huge difference in how long a sentence the perp receives, or even if charges are filed against him at all. The challenge is that what is in a person's head or heart is not something that is always readily apparent on video footage from a security camera. So, even though such images existed in this case, it did not necessarily mean a conviction would be a slam dunk. Leonard claimed there were things that happened that simply did not show up on the video. He offered his own account of what occurred that morning. The events in his version largely matched up with what could be seen on the video, but he tried his best to cast an entirely new light on them. And, since much of the case hinged on what was going through Leonard's mind, his perspective was potentially crucial. What we are about to share with you is the story Leonard told the court. We make no claims that it is accurate. According to Leonard, when he initially approached Harrison and Oliphant in the parking lot, 
He simply offered to give them some money for food. And they responded rudely, so Leonard walked away. When he got back to his truck, one of the men called out some obscenities to his companion, Samantha Silva. Leonard spun around and went right back to the men. He stood up for his friend, telling the men they were scaring her and they should just leave her alone. The young men seemed almost amused by Leonard's protest. What are you going to do, man? They asked him. Do you want to die? We'll kill you. Leonard retreated, telling Silva to get out her phone and call 911. But she didn't have a cell phone with her. He decided then to go back inside McDonald's and get one of the employees there to contact the police. When he let the men know that that was his plan, they came at him. Oliphant tossed a knife at him, and Harrison threw a shard of glass at his face, cutting him. Leonard grabbed the knife from the ground and got into the truck. He was now safe. But he couldn't help but think about his civic responsibility. He described the two men as crazy, violent. Who knew who they might go after next? Who they might hurt, or even kill? He maneuvered his truck as close as he could get to the McDonald's and then tried to slip in so he could call the police about these men. But Oliphant screamed at him, and Leonard, scared, took a chain from his truck only so he could protect himself. And then Oliphant kicked things up a notch. He yelled that he would break out the windows in Leonard's truck. Leonard had no choice. He had to keep his truck from getting damaged. He walked back towards the men, swinging the chain around in order to scare them away from his vehicle. It worked. They backed off. Leonard seized the opportunity to grab Harrison's bike. He figured that that would at least delay the men from leaving, giving the police time to get there and arrest the pair. But his plan went awry and only seemed to make things worse. One of the men yelled, Get the girl! An elephant took off running towards the truck while Silva waited alone, and utterly undefended. Leonard raced towards Oliphant, dropping the bike, which Harrison swiftly recovered. It was then that Harrison heard one of the men say, Pop him with the gun. Leonard claimed he immediately ducked into the McDonald's, handing the knife that had been thrown at him to one of the workers. These people assaulted me, he said. Here's the evidence. Please call 911. I need help. He straightened himself up, adding that he was going to stop them, and then he walked back out to the lot. When he got out there, both Harrison and Oliphant were gone. So it seems there was nothing more for him to do but to go home. So he got into his truck and slowly pulled out of the McDonald's lot. But then he spotted the two men. They were heading towards another restaurant parking lot, going away from him. He figured they had deliberately chosen that direction in order to get away from him. As he watched them, he thought about what they had done. They started it, he told himself. They attacked me. They assaulted me. They threatened the girl. And they had a gun. They needed to be stopped. So he followed them into the other parking lot, speeding up to catch up to them. His plan was not to strike them with his truck, he said. His only thought was to use his truck to block off their ways of getting away. He only wanted to delay them long enough for the police to get there and get the situation under control. But then Harrison somehow stepped right out in front of the truck. Leonard slammed on the brakes, but it was just too late. He hit Harrison and sent him flying into the air. At that point, he turned his attention to Oliphant to try to keep him from getting out of the area. But that didn't work. Oliphant succeeded in getting away. So, Leonard decided to go back and check up on Harrison. Leonard claimed he never intended to run over him a second time. He didn't know where anyone would have gotten that idea. And he certainly never kicked the wounded man, though in this case he understood why some witnesses might have thought otherwise. When he approached Harrison to see if he was all right, Leonard noticed a pistol lying underneath the man. Remembering how the men had earlier threatened to use that weapon on him, 
Leonard said he thought it would be prudent to use his foot to roll over Harrison and then kick the weapon away from his reach. Leonard also insisted it was ridiculous to charge him with a hate crime since he was not a bigot, and the race of Harrison and Oliphant had absolutely nothing to do with what happened. The incident occurred not because of who the men were, but because of what they did. He went on to explain that despite his reference to these people thinking they were special because of the election of President Barack Obama, he actually felt that Obama was doing a good job as president. Leonard did concede that he used the N-word, but said that instead of putting an E-R at the end of it, he used an A. He felt that pronunciation made it less racial and offensive because it could be used to describe people of any race. Leonard's claim that he didn't have a racist bone in his body were, frankly, fairly easily dismissed. But things were a bit murkier with other aspects of his story. Much of it certainly seemed difficult to credit, but none of the elements of his tale directly contradicted the video evidence. How could the jury figure out the truth of what was going on in Leonard's mind on June 6, 2013? Well, for one thing, they could look back at what he told police at the time. He never once told any agent of law enforcement that anyone had spoken that morning about shooting him. In fact, the first time he said anything at all to that effect was during his testimony at the trial. That seemed awfully convenient. If the threat of gunfire had actually been made and had motivated him to do what he did, then why wouldn't he have mentioned it at the time? And there were other elements of his story that he did not mention at the time. On the morning this all happened, he said nothing about offering the men money, nothing about them threatening to smash up his truck windows, not a word about them saying, get the girl or pop him with a gun. Unbelievably, on that day, he did not even try to claim that hitting Harrison with his truck had been an accident. None of those quite important details seemed to come up until Leonard needed to cook up a self-serving story to offer the jury. That seems to be a pretty good argument for doubting Leonard's tale. Ironically enough, to a certain extent, it did not even matter whether or not the jury believed Leonard or not. The law gives an individual the right to use force, even deadly force, in self-defense or in defense of another. But that right is not a blank check. There are limits on it. A person can only use deadly force when the threat of harm is immediate. You cannot kill someone just because you have a hunch they might theoretically pose a threat to someone else at some undetermined point in the future. No matter what you believe happened in the McDonald's parking lot, it was over by the time Leonard drove his truck out of there. He was safe, and neither he nor his friend Samantha Silva were in any danger whatsoever. When he followed the men into the second parking lot, he became the aggressor, and any self-defense or defense of another claims he could have made evaporated. The jury convicted Leonard of the murder of Harrison and the attempted murder of Oliphant, and it found that he committed those crimes, at least partially because the two men were black. The judge sentenced him to 32 years. He is incarcerated today and will remain so for a long time to come. So right now we're going to take a quick pause and go off script for a moment to give you a sense of what Kevin and I both think about this case. What do you think about this case? <laughs> to me, Leonard seems like a liar and... So much of what he said about the confrontation between him and these two victims uh, seems incredibly self-serving and dishonest for him. Uh, you know, there's the, there's the whole matter of, oh, I'm not a racist. You know, I said an incredibly racist thing and was heard by observers using racial slurs in my confrontation. But that's that has nothing to do with the crime. And I think it's also important to point out that there's no physical evidence supporting his version of events. Like he talks about that there was a gun at the scene right by Harrison. And you might wonder, well, what happened to this gun? Was such a gun recovered? Uh, such a gun was not recovered because he says somebody came up to 
Harrison and went through his backpack and saw the gun and said, I'm Harrison's cousin, and he took the gun and rode off. So that's his story. It doesn't really seem credible. And to me, even when he's trying to, you know, make up basically a really positive turn of events, you know, in terms of making him look good in front of a jury, he's still the one who's sort of needlessly escalating the situation. Seems like every escalation takes place because of his reaction to what's going on. You know, uh, he he reacts to the initial uh, situation in the McDonald's parking lot. Then it becomes physical. Then he follows these guys to IHOP. And at every turn, it's not the two victims who are escalating things. He's taking it to that next level where things become even more serious. And I think that's very telling that even he can't really explain around that. Yeah, and it's like the court said, he could have just gone home and said he was the one who turned into the other parking lot. And even in uh, his his words that we quoted, he said, I became the aggressor, and he was absolutely right. And I just think it's unfortunate, too, because whatever Oliphant and Harrison were doing, I think, unfortunately, this situation sort of fits a certain playbook in terms of racialized violence in this country, where, um, you know, two black people are seen as being less than deferential to to a white person, in this case, Leonard. We don't know uh, what race Silva was, so we don't know how that factors into this. But, you know, that then that somehow becomes justification for Leonard to kill one of them, you know, and, and attempt to kill the other one. And, I mean... <laughs> If everybody reacted that way the second they had a sort of uncomfortable or tense exchange in public, I mean, it would just be a bloodbath every day, all day. So to act, to act as if he was doing something that was in any way justified is, uh, is, is kind of fitting in with that racist narrative, in my opinion. I couldn't agree more. I think that says it perfectly. Should we go back to the script? Yeah, let's hit back to the script. Leonard's attorney... Danny Brace, faced stormy days in the years after this case. After he got caught mishandling funds belonging to some of his clients, he was disbarred and could no longer practice law. Unfortunately, a much worse fate awaited Toussaint Harrison's friend, Justin Oliphant. In June of 2015, he was walking down a street in Sacramento when two men started pursuing him. He tried to get away, but he wasn't as lucky as he had been before. He could not escape. The men gunned him down in a flurry of shots, and he died even before police arrived. In this case, there was not a man like Dan Gandy to keep the perps at the scene. They escaped and have never been caught. Every year, his family releases balloons in his memory, and they still hope that someday someone will uncover the identities of the men who took Justin away from them. If by some chance you have any information about that case, please contact the Sacramento Police at 916-808-5471. For this episode, we relied on press coverage in the Sacramento Bee, ABC 10, Fox 40, and the opinion of the Court of Appeals for the Third Appellate District in California in People v. Leonard. That opinion also includes a fuller legal analysis of the issues raised in this case. And so, if you're interested in those matters, it is well worth a read. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on the Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at MSheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to the Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure and send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.